On a lovely day in August, my husband and I and our son and our niece hopped in the car and we drove 500 miles south to a lovely little town in Nebraska called Beatrice. It is spelled Beatrice, but the locals say Beatrice. And that's here nor there, has nothing to do with the story. But we joined about 30,000 other people in a field right outside of Beatrice, Nebraska. Now, what would draw 30,000 people to a remote part of Nebraska? I mean, were we there to see a concert? Were we put on by our favorite band? Were we there to see a sporting event? Were we there to see a politician or a celebrity? No, we were all there doing one thing. We were all focused on the solar eclipse. It was awesome. That is my niece and me and our son and my husband. It was amazing to be gathered with 30,000 people in this field in remote Nebraska and Bill Nye the science guy was there and he was narrating what we were watching as the eclipse took place. And he was on a loudspeaker so we could all hear him. And he did the countdown, 10, 9, 8, where we could all take off our solar eclipse glasses. Because only if you were in the path of the total solar eclipse, when the moon completely covered up the sun for two minutes and two seconds, could you have your solar eclipse glasses off. Three, two, one, glasses off. Everybody cheered. It was so amazing to share in that moment with everyone. And then we really got silent. Like there was like, woohoo, eclipse. Yeah, I mean, all of us science nerds were excited. And then it was silent because it really was dark. It looked like dusk. And it felt like the temperature dropped a few degrees and there's a little chill in the air. And it was kind of eerie to be a part of it. And in this silent moment, my son goes, it really is dark, it really is dark, it really is dark. But in those moments of silence, it was just cool to look out and see all of us focused on one thing. We were all excited to see this one moment, this astronomical event taking place. And as I looked out, I didn't know what religion everyone was, their political views. In that moment, you feel that there's so much more that unites us than divides us. And you realize we're just tiny little specks on this planet, tiny little specks in this huge solar system. It was a beautiful moment. And the words that came to me as I was looking up at the total solar eclipse were from the Psalm 46. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I was there surrounded with people, and yet there was a stillness to that moment as we were all focused on one thing. This Psalm 46 calls us to focus on one thing. We are called to focus on God who is our refuge and strength. And in this psalm, it talks about inviting us to focus on God even in the midst of an ever-changing world, even in the midst of things that are going on all around us that are beyond our control. In the psalm, it lifts up natural events like earthquakes taking place. It talks about the mountains shaking in the heart of the sea. And even in those moments, to be still and put our focus and put our trust in God. Now, even though back then they didn't scientifically know what was causing things like earthquakes and we have an understanding of shifting tectonic plates, even with that understanding, if you are in an earthquake, it is frightening, it is overwhelming. But those are the moments that we are called to put our trust in God. This psalm also lifts up human events and human humanly caused disasters. It lifts up things like war, when nations are in an uproar and kingdoms are tot tottering. 
When there is war going on anywhere in the world, it is unsettling, it is frightening, it is overwhelming. And there are many people who get caught in the middle of conflicts. And it's very frightening. And over and over again, this psalm keeps calling us to place our trust in God, to see God as our refuge and our strength, a very present help in times of trouble. What I love about this psalm is also a part of it that talks about um, God as being beyond what we can comprehend, but also very near and familiar. There's a verse in there that says, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The word hosts, that's a word that means armies. And people back in that day when the Old Testament was written thought that the heavens were full of angels and heavenly beings and armies of heavenly beings. And to show how powerful God was, they said, God is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of all the heavenly armies. So God is bigger than anything that is out there and beyond that we don't understand. But then in the next line, it says, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Who's Jacob? Well, for people who were living in those Old Testament times and people who know scriptures, Jacob is an ancestor in our faith. Jacob is the son of Isaac and the grandson of Abraham. Jacob is someone who had um, a very colorful life, but then he also had this experience of wrestling with God. And he came away from this wrestling match with God with a new name. Jacob's new name was Israel, and he had 12 sons who became the leaders of the tribes of Israel. So when people would read, the God of Jacob is our refuge, they would see this God is the God who also is the God of my great, 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 great grandfather, Jacob. So he is near, he is familiar, but he's also the same God that's the Lord of hosts, that's more powerful than anything that is above and beyond my understanding. That's a beautiful thing. This psalm also talks about how God, in this most powerful sense, is powerful in a way that's different than we use power. It says that God is so powerful, God can make wars cease. Rather than using the power to start wars, God can make wars cease. God can break the implements of war. That's the kind of powerful God that we have. That's the God who is our refuge and strength. Psalm 46 was Martin Luther's favorite psalm. We have been talking about Martin Luther a lot this month, because on October 31st, it'll be the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Do we got any Reformation fans? Woohoo! 500 years! It was 1517. In 1517, on October 31st, when Martin Luther posted 95 grievances he had with the church of his day. Now, this may seem like a simple thing, like, why did this cause such a stir? Other people had had grievances with the church of that time as well. Why is it all of a sudden a big deal that Martin Luther has 95 grievances and the whole world knows about them? Martin Luther shared his grievances in a very down-to-earth way, and he, and he also published his grievances with the newly invented printing press. He used that so that Tons of people, common people, could get a hold of these pamphlets that actually listed what the 95 grievances or theses were so that people could read through them and actually begin to have a dialogue and debate and actually want to challenge the church and say, this isn't right, why are you doing this? So Martin Luther started a huge conversation, which in itself doesn't seem like something that should ruffle anybody's feathers, but he also introduced this conversation into a time of political unrest and instability. Martin Luther lived in the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire stretched up into Europe, parts of the Middle East, and Asia and Africa, and even into the new worlds of the Americas. The Holy Roman Empire was a huge empire. And it was called Holy to show that the Pope also was high up in the empire and the monarchy. 
And this was very hard to hold the Holy Roman Empire together. There were lots of wars. There was lots of unrest during that time. And so Martin Luther, all of a sudden, putting religious grievances on top of political grievances that people throughout the empire had, was like throwing that match into a powder keg. It just exploded the situation. It was taken so seriously that Martin Luther had to stand before the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, King Charles V, in 1521. And he was supposed to stand there before this most powerful man in the world and say, I take back everything I wrote. I'm sorry, I won't do it again. That's what he was supposed to say. But this is what he actually said before the emperor. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. May God help me. Amen. That didn't go over really well with the emperor. What does it say he stands on? He says, here I stand, may God help me. I, I underlined it in case you need help. What was he standing on? What was his conscience bound to? Okay, I just want to make sure people are still awake and alive because I know I'm geeking out on solar eclipses and 500-year-old history, but this is really a cool moment. He said he stands on one place on one thing, the word of God. From that moment on, he was no longer protected in the Holy Roman Empire, and he had to flee for his life. I wonder if that's the moment where Psalm 46 became his favorite psalm, where all of a sudden he realized that his words had unleashed a lot of unrest and things beyond his control, and he needed more than any other time in his life to that point to know that God was his refuge and strength. God was the one thing he could stand on. God was the one place of safety for him. This might be that moment for him when he realized that. So what do we stand on? Sometimes it's easy to see what is most important and know how to stand in that place. Like, it was really easy for my husband and I, since it was on a Monday when the solar eclipse happened and that's our day off, like, hey, let's drive 500 miles, see this two-minute event, and then turn around and come home, which we did, and it was worth it, and it was awesome, and we were all focused on one thing all together in just one tiny part in Nebraska, and there were people all across from Oregon to South Carolina who were also doing the same thing on that day of the eclipse. That was easy. But it's often hard when things in our lives are moving and shifting and changing and things are happening that we can't control. It's hard to know how to stand on that one thing. It's hard to know how to focus in the right place and know where our refuge is and know where our strength is. Now, I don't have any magic solutions for how to do that, and Martin Luther didn't either. But one thing that he knew was that he couldn't live his faith by himself. He had to stand in front of the emperor that day by himself. But he knew he couldn't live out his faith and act on it all by himself. He needed to be together with other people to help him along in his faith, to help him grow in his faith, to help him stand strong in the things that he knew to be true. And I think for all of us, we need each other. This psalm wasn't just written to one person. It was written to a whole community of people. It says God is our refuge and strength. God is a help to us. The Lord of hosts is with us. It's not just me as an individual or you as an individual trying to do it all by yourself. And Martin Luther knew that he needed to worship with others and be held up with others and hold other people up. And he knew music was powerful. And he wrote a number of songs based on scripture. And he wrote a song based on this piece of scripture, on Psalm 46. But he translated one of the words differently. Instead of 
saying God is our refuge and strength, he translated it as God is our fortress and strength. So can you think of what song may have been written? Any Lutheran nerds in the house? A mighty fortress is our God. Through that song, he talks about the unrest and the things that were going on in his life and in his world and how God was his very present help in that time of trouble. He used those same words that he used before the emperor. May God help me. Amen. So when we gather together, let's sing out. Let's know that through our singing, that we're reminding one another where to focus, the one thing that we can all stand on. And so my hope is that we all can have that place where we can know that God is there for us, that God is our refuge, that we can turn to no matter what. Amen.